typically you can buy a special lens group that you plug into the back end of your telescope. It's typically designed for a lens of the particular focal length range that you're using. Theoretically, it should be only good for one focal length, but there's a range for which it's good enough. And so you'll be able to get a uh, field flattener that'll clear up the corners quite well, usually at the expense of some uh, degradation in the aberrations in the corners. But, you know, it's worse having it out of focus than to have a little bit of out around star images there. Okay. Uh, no, that I added. I'm sorry. I had to add that because I was, I glossed over it last time and I, I regretted having done that because it's pretty important to have sharp focus all the way across your, your uh, sensor field. Um, camera lenses that are really high quality, that are so called prime lenses that have one focal length, have a field flattener that's usually pretty good. It'll almost invariably be solid across the field except in the very extreme corners you know by extreme corners I mean the stars right around there might show a little bit of elongation that might be visible and might not be certainly not visible in a print you have to magnify the devil out of it to really see it okay so that's something to consider if you have a really small image sensor that covers only the center portion of the lens's field of view then you may not notice it so much. So don't be dissuaded from using your, your refractor, whatever you've got, just because you don't have a field flattener and you don't want to invest the money in it just yet. If you have a high quality um, telephoto lens for general photography, you're already set up. So you don't need to worry about it. Now, that was the example I gave before of a Canon 400 millimeter, 400 millimeter f5.6 lens that is probably the sharpest lens I've ever seen for general photography and for astrophotography. And there are others. This is not the only one. But the interesting thing about this is that's $1,150 roughly. It's hard to find a good refractor for anything less than that. So that's something to consider in your decisions about uh, astrophotography. I started talking about polar alignment. This is probably the most important thing about astrophotography. If you don't have accurate polar alignment, it's going to cause you trouble. And it's going to force you to take shorter exposures than you should be just to avoid trailing. And the trailing can occur um, either in the sense that it's mistracking enough that you have drift in the one of the axes, typically declination, which typically is, is counteracted by the auto guider. Unfortunately, when you counteract it with the auto guider, the image rotates around the guide star. So you have rotations in the corners. So the better your polar alignment accuracy, the better imaging you're going to get. And, you know, I, I showed you these diagrams. Uh, this is a simple case where you only have an elevation error and you're polar axis pointing to the celestial pole and what happens there is there's a drift and declination over the <coughs> tracking that you uh, when you're tracking your objects with a guide uh, the guide scope um, if you're off in both elevation and azimuth then you're going to drift both in declination and right ascension and that's for sure going to cause you uh, rotational uh, errors <coughs> there is a um, calculator available at this website that's in the handouts calculates the uh, amount of rotation that occurs versus uh, the polar misalignment when you enter the time be sure to enter the total time if you have 20 exposures of five minutes each it's a hundred minutes of exposure that you're entering into the into the calculation now the important thing here is if your polar alignment isn't perfect if five minutes is too short a time to get any significant rotation and don't worry about it. It'll be rare that you're going to make exposures longer than five minutes with a DSLR for a couple of reasons. One is the fact that it's not temperature controlled and the buildup of thermal noise is eventually going to bite you. So not, I wouldn't recommend more than five, six minutes maximum exposure time with a DSLR. 
if you invest in a cooled camera, then as long as you can possibly tolerate it, uh, will work. Okay. Uh, the tracking heads I mentioned, the tracking, the polar alignment with this particular tracking head is if you're within half a degree of the pole, you're going to be lucky. Uh, a lot of telescope mounts that are go-to mounts have this kind of a rig for a, a polar alignment. It has a reticle, it has a very large field of view with the polaris shown on a circle. And you have to get the dials set right in order to get the thing aligned correctly to align, to put the, correctly put the pole star inside the circle that's on the reticle. That's a bit of a nuisance, it works, but the fact that it's such a large field of view here means that you're gonna get 10 arc minutes maybe of uh, accuracy in aligning the pole. Uh, this is a different one that doesn't require setting dials. You simply put the pole star right here and two other stars on these uh, tick marks. And which tick marks depends on what decade you're, you're using. That's a bit more accurate. You should be able to get five arc minutes or better. The best for a visual alignment is the reticles that look like this. The pole star goes around a clock dial on the reticle. This radius of this circle is the displacement of the pole star from the true celestial pole, which is about half a degree. It's actually more like 45 arc minutes. There's an app that tells you exactly where the star, the pole star is on that clock for a particular uh, time of day and uh, season. That will get you aligned to within about three arc minutes or better. And that's usually good enough for most astrophotography. Okay? There is a recently marketed gadget called a Pole Master. It's a camera that mounts on the well, typically mounts on the polar axis of your telescope. It doesn't have to be. You just have to have it on the telescope so that it follows the RA movement of your telescope and can point directly toward the pole in order to do the polar alignment. And what it does is it takes an image of a field of view that's about, I don't know, about 11 degrees, roughly. But it's sensitive enough because of its high quantum efficiency to give you images of very dim stars. And so what you do is you get a, you get a reference image. Polaris will be obvious because it's the brightest thing in there. The software will tell you to identify Polaris and to pick a star that's not Polaris. And then it'll tell you to move the polar axis about 30 to 40 degrees. And identify that same star again that you had picked before. And then it'll ask you to move the, the scope and right ascension again from another 30 or 40 degrees. And then you click and it calculates a circle that is the exact rotation of that star around your polar axis. That's a very precise calculation, okay? It'll put up a, uh, an inset which tells you you're going to put Polaris inside that inset on the crosshairs. Once you do that, you click again, then it'll give you an ultra-magnified image and you can get within half an arc minute of the true polar alignment with that device. Probably overkill for most things, but for me, with my lousy knees, I'm using it because I don't like to get down and look through that polar scope any more than I have to. So those are the options. I'd say you know, the cheapest thing is this because uh, Ioptron sells uh, polar alignment scopes with that reticle. Um, I don't know what it is, about $50, $60. And uh, it's designed specifically for their mounts, but there are other companies, I think Astrophysics makes one, and I think a couple of others do as well. And if you're reasonably competent with machining things, you can make an adapter for that polar scope to fit almost any scope. I did that for a G GM8 Las Monde mount, and that works just fine. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through the details of this. You can look at it in the, in the handout, but this gives you an idea of how much of an error, uh, what degree of polar alignment is, and so forth. So 
I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, the best accuracy for polar alignment is so-called drift alignment. That typically takes a minimum of two hours, if not longer, sometimes all night if you want to get as accurate as possible. Not necessary for a portable setup. If you're going to build an observatory, that's what you're going to use. Don't use anything else, because that is the ultimate accuracy. Okay, so now we're going to go through the process of getting ready for your imaging. Now, what, what I'm going to do is when we take a break, I'm going to ask people to uh, make a mark on my chart of who's attending the class. I want to know who's coming to the session at Lockwood Valley on July 9th. I want to know how many people are going to be there so we can make arrangements to make sure that we have resources to support questions and so forth. There's going to be my telescope, that's this one, set up out there. I'm going to be imaging, and I'm going to show you how to get that set up. We're also going to have set up the Takahashi on the astrophysics mount that was donated to the club a year and a half ago. And that scope, if you have a DSLR and you have a T-mount adapter and a T-mount to two-inch eyepiece adapter for that, we can plug it into the Takahashi and you can get images on your camera through the Takahashi. And that's the reason I need to know how many people we can determine how many exposures you can take and all that kind of thing so we have a chance of everybody getting images done. Okay? Yes, sir. Can you bring your own scope and camera? Absolutely. And if you need any help setting it up, you know, I'll spend time with you on that. I recommend you do that if you have equipment. I have a field flattener on my T adapter for the refractor I use. Is that good no. to take it on? Take it off. Take it off. There's a field flattener already on the talk. I think there is. I, I, I could stand corrected. We'll have to find out. Uh, I'll have to double check it. Probably would for that. Uh, whatever you've got won't be right for the talk. I know there's a field flattener for the talk because I, I know it's in the kit. The Takahashi, I think, has every accessory. That I th yeah, that particular Takahashi has every extension tube, every accessory you can buy. I mean, the guy went, probably went to a shop and says, I want that scope and every accessory we can get, and I want the best possible mount we can get. I mean, he's, I, I swear it must have been $30,000 worth of gear into that. So we are very lucky to have it. And I'm on the committee that's getting that set up where we'll have a, an enclosure at the Lockwood Valley site that will set up so that we can get people signed up to use it after they've been trained to use it. So it's going to become a resource that the club has available for the members to use. Okay, setting up. Um, something like this with a... Uh, 135 millimeter telephoto lens and a tracking mount. This is an ioptron mount. It has that same alignment reticle I mentioned before. Uh, if you align that, that little guy and put a 135 millimeter lens on your DSLR, you will get beautiful images as long as your exposures are not more than two minutes because the periodic error will bite you on that one. Okay? This is my particular setup. There's probably a thousand other ways to set up gear for astrophotography. What I have here is a Teleview 85, a field flattener, a DSLR, that's that Rebel SL1 I mentioned before. This is a 45 millimeter refractor that I use for a guide scope, 325 millimeter focal length. There's the uh, QHY guide camera, which cost about $200. This little rig here is an azimuth elevation adjuster that I put on there thinking I'd have to be searching for guide stars. I've never had to do it. I have that thing bore sighted with the uh, main scope and never pointed to an object that I couldn't find a guide star, star that would work. And I think you're going to find that to be true with that particular guide camera. It's very sensitive, so it should work just fine. Okay. Uh, a few things about cameras. And do you use yes. a, a laptop to control the... You're going to have to have a laptop well, to do the auto-guiding. You have an intervalometer on your... That's for the camera. 
Yeah. You're going to need the laptop for the guiding. The guide camera plugs into the right. laptop. You're going to run software, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, uh, a piece of software called PHD2. And it, it interfaces with the camera, uh, takes an image. You can identify, uh, you'll, you'll see the details, but it'll, it'll do the auto-guiding for you. The advantage of, uh, come on. Oh, don't crash on me now. All right. The advantage of this guide camera is you have, all right, nothing like a small, slow computer. Uh, this guide camera has a USB cable that goes to your laptop. Okay, that's interfaces with the PHD2. The other little cable sticking out is the is the the auto guiding control cable that plugs into your guide port on your mount. It's already on the camera, so you don't have an extra cable going off the telescope. It's already on the telescope. Okay, coming back to this. The eyepiece on your DSLR is a light leak path. Usually, cameras will come with a little rubber thing that will clip over the eyepiece and block the light for long exposures. If you don't have one, get a piece of black tape and put it over the eyepiece. I guarantee you, if you don't do that, you're going to make a mistake, shine a light to the back of your camera, and it will ruin your image. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, for the sake of your night vision, my camera has a constant display of parameters on the back of the camera when it's set to go. And also, when an image is finished and it's storing the image, it displays the image for a few seconds on the back. You can turn that off. In fact, you should, because it really serves no useful purpose. But this on my camera will only go out if I have a capacitive coupling to the back of the camera by putting it up to my eye. I tape a, a black card over that so I don't have to look at the light from that screen. I can untape it, make adjustments if I have to, but I typically don't. Okay? So that's critical. You don't want to mess up anybody's dark sky adaptation. Even if you don't care about yours, you have to worry about other people. And yet, on some of the newer ones, you can just turn it inside. You know, yeah, yeah, the sure. The sure, that's fine too. Whatever it takes to keep that light away from ruining your, eye, your night vision. <clears throat> okay, some calibration things have to be done. We're going to get into this in more detail when we start doing the uh, hands-on stuff. Sometime during the night, when you're taking your images, you should take a series of dark images. Cover the lens on your telescope or, or the lens of your, your camera lens so that no light is admitted. You take exposures exactly the same ISO number and shutter time as your sub-exposures for your deep sky object. Okay, You'll take at least 10 of those. So if you've got Five minute exposures, you're going to have to do 50 minutes worth of dark sky stuff, I mean, dark images. That's unavoidable. That is your calibration for the thermally generated noise in your camera and also the hot pixels that are in your camera sensor. The software will get rid of that during the processing. There's a parameter, sir. Once you do it, do you have to do it every time? If you have a thermally controlled camera, Probably not. The problem with the DSLR is it's tracking the environmental temperature, and typically when it gets dark, it's cooling. So you're never going to have it exactly right. So for DSLRs, once a night is probably OK. But you've got to kind of pick when that time is. If you're taking images, say, early, in the evening, early after dark, then take your darks after your first sequence. And that's probably close enough. It won't be accurate, but you know there are more uh, errors that are going to come up because of the fact that you have an uncooled sensor than you know do you typically encounter with a cooled camera, a cooled uh, 
uh, CCD chip that's used for really constrained to astrophotography purposes. There is a, okay, anything else? There's another thing called a bias image. DSLR cameras will diddle with the zero point, the dark point on your camera. The sensor outputs um, noise that is uh, effectively read noise that has nothing to do with the thermal noise. It's just the noise that's generated because you're taking a reading of the number of electrons that have gone into the pixels. That's what's called the bias image. Also, there's a uh, the DSLRs will bias from the true zero point to some point above zero so that your black point in your, in your general photography images aren't affected by the, uh, by the uh, uh, offset images, that are the offset signal from the pixels. And typically that's done rather artfully, and you might even ignore this. But if you do use this, take the shortest possible exposure with uh, the lens cap on your telescope or camera. And that'll give you a set of images, 10 of those, and save them. That'll give you your bias information, okay? <clears throat> Does it have to be at the same temperature also? Or yeah, temperature is irrelevant for that because they're super short exposures. That's only to get the, um, the bias information for the camera itself if it's a DSLR, and also the read noise information. And you get ten, these 10 images for thermal and 10 images for bias, you're going to average them to get some reasonable approximation of what's there. It varies with time, and so the best you can do is take an average. You're going to subtract it from your, 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 dark, your, your light images that you take of the deep sky object. It's never perfect, but it's better than, than not doing it. Okay. Then there's some lens calibration you're going to need to do. Uh, the most important one is the so-called flat field image. That's what you do. What you do there is you're, you're going to cover the lens with a translucent material. It can be something as dumb as a T-shirt, stretched tightly over the lens. And during the dusk time, let's say before it's completely dark, you point the camera straight up with this thing over it, and you take some exposures to get what's called a flat field. And what that will do is it'll give you uh, a chance to correct out any vignetting that your lens has or your telescope has, and also the so-called dust motes. Any dust that's on the sensor will leave a, an image there in the uh, flat field image. You can then average a bunch of those together and, and, and correct for that in the, uh, in the final image, okay? And if you want to really be absolute about the thing, you'll also do a, a dark field correction for the whatever time exposure you needed to get that flat field. I rarely do that for a DSLR. It really doesn't make that much difference. But the flat field does make a difference. Okay, and I kind of dis uh, discussed this uh, dark image thing pretty well. Um, there are, by the way, there are light box devices you can buy to put over your lens to actually do the, uh, field, the flat field uh, correction. They usually cost a couple of hundred bucks. Uh, the dusk images with a translucent material over the lens works pretty well. Some people have actually used the dusk light without a cover to do this, and I don't recommend that because um, lenses have a habit of focusing star images back onto your sensor. Even though you can't see them with your eye, they're going to show up. So you want to diffuse the image on the way in. So for the flat field, you're suggesting like stretching a t-shirt material, which is, yeah. which is porous. Oh yeah, but you, it's two layers. You know, you just take two layers okay. so it so averages out. Or, or you could use a, a piece of very solid white cloth that isn't as porous? Uh, you want to have some light admitted through it. You want it to have it fairly uh, light transparent. Another thing you can do is you go to a plastic supply place and buy a, a uh, diffusing screen. It's a piece of plastic that 
um, is looks like ground glass surface. You can even use a piece of ground glass. Take a piece of glass, take a piece of sandpaper and just sand the devil out of it until it's all completely milky colored on the surface. And that can be a good diffuser. Yes, sir? Taking uh, a large glass disc, smaller than the ball of the camera, just put the carbon on it. Like yeah, or whatever it takes to, to ruin the surface so it's a, so it's a diffuser. Uh, you know, whatever piece of glass or plastic you use. Boulder's glass? No, 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 don't do that. You want the light to be diffused going through the optics. You don't want something that's just dimming the light. In fact, you don't want to dim the light, particularly. What you want is, well, is, is what's called a Lambertian diffusion. That is, uh, a beam of light comes in and it's dispersed over a hemisphere uniformly. It's almost impossible to create a thing like that in reality. But that's the idea of what you want. Can you repeat the name of that glass thing that you're going to use? Uh, a piece of uh, diffusing screen you can buy in a plastic shop. They're used for rear projection screens, typically. Something like that works really well. I've used them, and they do a real good job. They actually do a better job than a t-shirt. Because a t-shirt can have coloration over the surface that's left over from uh, a little jogging or something. OK. Um, and f for the flat field image, you want to ex experiment with the exposure time so that you have roughly between 30 and 50% of the total dynamic range of, that the image can take where most of your light is confined. And to be specific, here's what it should look like. Most cameras have the ability to show a, uh, a uh, histogram of your image. So here's the image of the diffuser screen. Well, it's the diffused light going through the diffuser screen. And that's the distribution of the light over that entire image. And it's sitting roughly at the halfway point. That's kind of what you want to target, a little bit in that range. You don't want it to get too high because you don't want to lose some of the brighter features and you don't want it too low because you don't want to lose the darker features. You want it right smack in the middle. Whatever exposure time it takes to get that is what you need. And by the way, again, this is a very important piece of the, the puzzle. <coughs> Theoretically, you can do this once for a given lens that you're using or telescope. However, unless you can guarantee you never get any dirt on your on your camera chip, you should plan on doing it every night. You're going to do imaging. And it doesn't take long exposures to do this. It's real quick. Yes, sir? Uh, I've noticed that, that you know, like, when, when I turn off the camera after shooting, you know, it does a sort of cleaning thing. Yes. So the dust modes kind of like go away. So, uh, so they say. How, how will the flat, in other words, if they take the flats first, so the dust mode would appear later. You take the well, afterwards, the dust mode what you can do is turn the camera on, turn it off, and then turn it on again. Then you had the dust removal operation the camera does before you do all your imaging. In other words, in other, let's put it this way. You put your lens or you, you, you mate your, tele, your camera with your telescope, okay? That captures the dust situation. Whatever it is, is it, is what's there. You turn your camera on, turn it off, turn it on, it goes through the dust cleaning cycle once, okay? Whatever's left on there, it'll never get off from that operation anyway. And you know there's gonna be something left over. This will record that dust and allow you to correct it, <coughs> correct it out of your image. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, setting up one of these things is really trivial. You just aim your telephoto lens at the object range, uh, field of view that you're going to. It's going to be a fairly large field of view, with even 135 millimeter lens. Kind of aim it at the area you want to photograph. Make sure you've got your polar alignment done. If you have a zoom lens, 
that you have to use. You don't have a prime lens. Don't worry about it. Use your zoom lens. But take a piece of gaffer's tape and tape that zoom ring to the body of the lens so it can't move during the imaging time. Okay? It sounds pretty dumb, but believe me, it will, it will eliminate a lot of grief. Okay, so that's basically the tracking mount idea. Um, frame your object. Uh, whatever aperture gives you the best images, you'll know that with your own lens. With a, t uh, astro a, a refractor that you're using for astrophotography, it's wide open anyway. Uh, have your drive running. Take a 30 to 60 second exposure at ISO 3200 or higher. Remember I told you never use that? This is the time when you do. And what this is going to do is it's going to get you a really grainy image of the area you're photographing. But it will tell you if you're framed right. And you won't waste a lot of time getting a whole string of images and find out you missed your object. Okay? When you get that and you're satisfied with it, return the ISO to a lower value, nothing greater than ISO 800. I work at ISO 200. And the reason I do that, as I showed you before, that has the highest dynamic range on my camera. And it's typically the highest dy dynamic range on most cameras. OK, uh, if you have a shutter timer, that I, like I mentioned, you set the total exposure time for your bulb setting, five minutes, two minutes, whatever it is you think you want to do. For a tracking mount, I would keep the exposures under two minutes because the periodic error in that thing will get you if you don't. Set a small delay in between unless you have a really fast memory card. And then uh, set the number of exposures uh, on the uh, timer. If you don't want to do that, leave the number of, uh, without a num leave the number of exposures at nothing, or not zero, but just no, no setting. And it'll run indefinitely until you stop it. It doesn't matter what you do. But I would also advise getting at least five more sub-exposures than you think you need because you're probably going to screw up one or two or three. Not because of something you did. The airplane flies through, satellite flies through, you bump them out. If your camera has a built-in intervalometer, is that OK? Or yeah, that's fine. Okay. Whatever it takes. Anything, is, anything that does that equivalent function will, will be perfectly good. OK, for a go-to equatorial mount, it gets to be a bit more difficult because uh, you have to do the auto-guiding. Uh, this scope with its TV85 with its field flattener is a 480 millimeter focal length. If you don't auto-guide, you will not get good images, period. You'll find that 90% of them or more have trailing star images. So auto-guiding is critical. I say a go-to mount because uh, a lot of people chide me for being wimpy because, hey, any good astronomer can find things without a go-to. And I agree with that. I've done it for years. But for astrophotography, I don't want to waste time looking for an object. I want to point to it. And furthermore, I want to point to a spot near the object to frame the thing the way I want it on the image. And I gave you an example of that last time where I screwed up an image because I didn't realize there were two other interesting objects in the field of view. If I had only moved over about three degrees. Okay. So you're going to use some kind of a uh, you know, star chart program to do that. It turns out that some of the planetarium programs will interface with some of these mounts. And you can go directly from figuring out the framing on the planetarium program, find a, a central, center point for your image, go to that center point, and you're set. And you'll go to the go-to in a couple of steps, typically, to get the greatest accuracy. And I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, PhD2 is a free piece of software, which you got on your, your DVD. It's as good as anything for all practical purposes. Some people swear by others. I don't care what you use, as long as it does the job. Okay. I like free. 
Okay. Uh, we talked about selecting the object and getting the planetarium going. Um, typically, if you bore sight your guide scope with your main optics so that the center of view of the main optics and the center of view of your guide scope are exactly the same, and that particular QHY camera that I've been using or something with similar quantum efficiency, I almost can guarantee that any object you pick in the sky, you'll find a guide star in the field of view of the guider. And as I told you, I have that as else mount on there, and it, it, it was totally unnecessary. Okay, we're going to talk about the PhD configuration. Uh, in the next couple of slides here. Okay. Talk about this. Uh, focal length range should be, you know, aperture between 50 and 80 millimeters for the guide scope. 50 millimeters is typically good enough. 300 to 400 millimeter focal length is a good focal length for most imaging. There are guide scopes that have 200 millimeter range of focal length. They'll work as long as you don't exceed about five, 600 millimeter focal length. And then it gets harder and harder to get the guiding to be accurate. You can put a 2x boiler in the, in the uh, uh, guide scope to get a longer focal length, and it'll get you out of the trouble for longer focal length imaging scopes. So, uh, but high quantum efficiency for the guide scope is, is the key. And this QHY camera is not the only one that has that capability. So if you don't like that for some reason, or you can't get one, there's others that have similar capability. Uh, the telescope mount has to have a guide port. It's typically called an ST4 port. It's, it's a six pin modular connector like on your telephone. The guide camera will have one on the back of the camera. That goes directly into your mount. PhD communicates with the camera and sends guiding, guide corrections through that port to the, to the telescope mount. The current version of PhD is 2.6.1. That's what's on your DVD. I also left a copy of PhD 2.5 there in case for some reason it doesn't run correctly, the new version on your, on your machine. I had no trouble with Windows 10. It shouldn't be a problem with uh, the 2.6. 2.6 is nice because there are some new tools that are built into it. Okay, setting up PhD. Uh, the window comes up, it looks like this. This little icon is your connect icon. You click on that, it brings up a pop-up window. You'll go here and find your guide camera in that list. And I would recommend you look at PhD, load up PhD on your, P, on your uh, notebook PC, run PhD without a camera, look at that list and make sure you don't buy a camera that is not on that list, <laughs> okay? Otherwise, it's a real pain in the butt. Uh, the second thing you need to consider is this thing called the mount. You'll get this pull down list and you'll hit on camera. If it isn't on camera, then there's this complicated interface through OSCOM. It can be done. I recommend not doing that for the first time you go out doing this stuff. Then you click Connect All, and um, there's a short delay. And if everything connects correctly and you have the right drivers and everything, it'll connect up and it'll be set. The next thing you're going to do, oh, let me back up a second. After you're connected, you see this little set of arrows pointed in a circle. What that does is this means repeated exposure. You click on that and it starts taking exposures with the camera with that exposure time. Typically one second is good enough. So set it for that. That's the default anyway. But if it isn't that, then set it for one second. You'll start seeing star images in here right away if you're focused. If you're not, focus it so you get nice clean star images. If your guide scope is not a perfect optical system, not a triplet with, you know, all that stuff, it doesn't matter if the image is a little cruddy. It'll still guide on it.
Okay, the next thing is, uh, well, let me back up again. There's a button here that will they'll start and stop the uh, auto guiding, okay? Uh, or start and stop this, this repeated imaging. This little brain shaped thing is a set of parameters that you're going to need to make sure are correctly set for your configuration. So you click on the brain, and you're going to get a window that looks like this. There's only two things you really need to worry about here. One of them is under the camera tab, and that's the pixel size of the camera chip itself. The QHY has 3.75 micrometer pixels. You'll type in whatever value it is for your particular guide camera. Under the guiding tab, there is a calibration area. There's the focal length of the guide scope. You'll type that in there too. Okay, That's used by PhD to give you information about the accuracy of the guiding. Automatically come up if your guide camera is listed in the earlier part? No. This number you have to type in for the pixel size for the camera chip. Pixel size for the camera chip, you must type that in. It is not transmitted down the USB cable to PhD. Okay? And that will be in the specs on your guide camera. Okay? Or if it's not, you'll have a number something that's the following. You're going to have a width of the sensor and the height of the sensor, the actual millimeter size of the sensor. And you're going to have the number of pixels in, in the horizontal and vertical direction. You take, for example, the horizontal width in millimeters, divide it by the number of pixels, and that'll give you the size of the pixels. And by the way, don't buy a guide camera that does not have square pixels. Some cameras have rectangular pixels. It will cause all kinds of headache if you have rectangular pixels. It will work, but it's a lot more effort to set up. I know because I did it once. Okay, again, the focal length has to go here. That just gives information to the PhD to help you set things up and to help you uh, check the quality of the guiding. Okay, um, after you've got that done, you will click the stop. Well, I'm sorry, you will, during the time that you're getting these repeated images, you'll find a star somewhere in that field of view. Don't pick a bright one. They typically saturate. A saturated star is not a good guide star. Okay? It's common that a guide star will be in the range of seventh to ninth magnitude. It may sound crazy that you've got a 50 millimeter aperture guiding on ninth magnitude, but believe me, that camera can do it. You'll pick that, whatever star looks promising, you'll click on it, there'll be a green box that'll be put around it immediately. Then you click the stop button, and uh, you make sure that everything is, is looking good, that there's no major drift problem there. You'll again click this repeated image thing, then you'll click this button here, the guide button. The guide button then will take that blue, that green uh, square, and it'll put a pair of yellow crosshairs through it. Okay? And then it will start a calibration process. It will drive the right ascension in, step, in 10 steps in one direction and then 10 steps back to the center again, 10 steps in the other direction, 10 steps back again, 10 steps in deck, back again, the other direction, 10 steps, and back again. That's the calibration step. That's telling PhD how your mount behaves. It also gets a measurement of your declination backlash. If you have excessive backlash, your guiding will be crappy. It will compensate for some of it, but if it's really bad, it won't be able to do it. And it'll probably give you an error message if it's really bad. Okay, once the calibration is done, the crosshairs turn green, and you're guiding right now. And if you don't disturb anything, it'll guide all on that object all night long. 
okay? So, some tools that are available. Oh, at some point after you've watched this thing guide, you'll click on a, there's a set of tools that are available in here um, under the tools menu. There is a graph that shows the right ascension and declination guiding corrections and, and guiding errors. And it's a continuously running graph as long as you're guiding. Now the vertical axis is what is where it's using the actual focal length of your guide scope and the pixel size to tell you how far the corrections are and how large the errors are. And that'll give you an idea how good the guiding is in real time. There are some controls down here that you can play with, and I won't tell you anything about that right now because it's only confusing. You might have to adjust those depending on your specific mount and optics. Arc seconds. arc seconds. It'll calculate the arc seconds from the focal length. Which do you prefer? Uh, for this graph, I prefer pixels okay. because I know how many, how big the pixels are in the guide scope, and I know how big the pixels are in the guide in the imaging camera. And I, there, I have a little application. I think I put it on your uh, uh, DVD. It's a. Uh, it's a spreadsheet program that will calculate the size of the pixel in arc seconds for your guide. Is it on there? For your guide camera and for your, your imaging scope. And there's a bunch of other stuff we'll talk about later that's very valuable and very useful. So you want this graph on the screen so you can monitor from time to time how well it's going. If this thing gets really ragged and gets really bad, you might have something wrong in your, in your setup. And you can terminate your images and fix it with setting parameters that are down here. I'll talk about that when we're in the dark sky session. Doing it now is something you probably won't remember because I won't if it was given to me. So I'm basing my lousy memory on as a reference point here. The other one is called a target. And this one I, I express in arc seconds. And the reason for that is every single position the guide star has taken during something like 400 different guiding cycles. Different guide, each one second roughly, it does a guiding cycle, correction, okay? So it wants to target the absolute center of that, of that target, but it'll never quite do that. Now this is set up, so I have a two arc second outer circle here. Now. It's rare that you'll be able to do better than two arc second images in the, in the uh, dark sky area. Very rare, okay? And what this shows you is, is the position the guide star, star had taken over that 400 intervals of time. And that's roughly what, where the, most of the energy of your star images on your imaging camera are located inside that two arc second circle. So if you're, Imaging pixels are the order of one and a half arc seconds. Your guiding is more than good enough. You're going to have seeing generated problems in your images before you'll have guiding problems. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Most of the DSLR pixels are really large. Well, actually, with my uh, Rebel SL1, those pixels are 4.3 arc seconds. I mean, uh, uh, micrometers. So not much larger than the guide scope. That was, a, that was an interesting challenge for me with that setup. And it turns out in my particular setup that you saw in that image, that the guide scope arc seconds per pixel and the imaging are pretty close. So what I see here, that's the reason I picked arc seconds here, because I know that they're pretty close match to what the star images are going to look like. So if your guiding was perfect, would they all be within that small circle? If the guiding was perfect, they would all concentrate at that center point. You'll no. never see that. Yeah. Ever. I'm just wondering what the range. If, okay. What's going to happen is your guiding is correcting drift in declination. It's correcting drift in right ascension. 
There's drift even if you're perfectly polar aligned because of atmospheric refraction. There's drift caused by different temperature cells of air crossing your field of view. All of that has to be corrected out. On top of all that is the right ascension gear periodic error. The worm that drives that gear is never perfect. And so typically it's a roughly six to 10 minute rotation time for that, that worm. And you will have it drift one way for a, a interval of time, another way, opposite way for a while, and it will drift back again to that point. And that total cycle is going to be the worm rotation cycle. Mixed in with that is imperfections in the teeth of the gears. And you're correcting all of that with the auto guider. That's if you'll never get perfect guiding. The best you can do, and that's what these parameters are for, is to fix it so that you can confine those dots to a two arc second circle. Then you will get nice images in your deep sky object. And if you ever come out imaging when you have a half arc second night, I'm sorry, you're going to end up with two arc seconds anyway because of the guiding. So you have to space for that. Yeah, right. I had that once, one night. Really? I was imaging. I had, you know, I noticed the guiding was really doing very little. Oh, okay. I got my stood around and looked and looked and looked and looked at the horizon. None of the stars were, were twinkling on the horizon. And that was in the middle of the week. I was up uh, at the Orange County site at the time. You know, there's three other guys up there. I walked over to one guy's pad and I said, you know, seeing is really, really good. He says, I noticed. I said, I know you have a key to the 22 inch. Can we go and look at Jupiter? And that's just what I, he said, that's just what I was going to head to do. He opened up the 22 inch telescope, we got it on Jupiter, put a high magnification eyepiece on it. You've seen photographs of Jupiter. That's what it looked like through the eyepiece. And once in a while it would wiggle ever so slightly and I could, we could see details on the, on the Galilean satellites. That was freaky. Saw that once, never again. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we have the tools to monitor what's going on. When you have this thing set at 400, it'll have a maximum of 400 points on that target. As new points come in, the oldest points get dumped off. So you have a kind of a running history of what the guiding is doing. And likewise, this graph uh, actually is recorded in a file in PhD. And you can go back and look at it afterward, days, weeks, anytime. When you're sitting down looking at your images, trying to figure out what went wrong on a particular image, there are two pieces of software included on that DVD that allows you to go back and look at those data that's been saved by PhD <coughs> You can go along, you look at the timestamp on your image that looks a little screwy. You can go down that set of curves and find the point in time where that occurred. You can find out exactly what happened. It's a very valuable tool. And if you kicked the mount, well, it'll show up there too. Okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief outline of planetary and lunar imaging. You have um, registacks included in your image, in your data, uh, your software in there. That's used so that you can take images at high magnification with short exposures, so you can take advantage of the lucky image intervals. When you're looking through a telescope at, say, Jupiter, you'll get fractions of a second where it's really nice and then it goes away. If you take short exposures like 10 milliseconds uh, with your uh, camera for planetary imaging and you gather a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand images in a, in a uh, AVI, uh, AVI uh, format, uh, 
Registax will crawl through all those images, find the ones that are clean, throw out the ones that are bad, stack all the good images to get rid of the noise because you're taking short exposures. Remember the business about photon arrivals are random, even with bright objects like Jupiter. And you'll get a nice clean image and then uh, you can use tools to sharpen that up and we'll talk about how to do that later. Planetary imaging, you need at least a 120 millimeter aperture. 200 is better. Anything is bigger is better as far as that goes. Uh, you want to minimize the, ap the aperture obstruction to the order of 30 to 40 percent. Typical um, Schmidt Cassegrains are in that range. That'll work fine. Your USB video camera should have small pixels, you know, four micrometers or smaller. Uh, frame size should be at least five by four millimeters, because otherwise it's hard to get a, a decent image for smaller pixels. Uh, 1280 by 960 is the smallest number of pixels you should try to use. You can use a 640 by 480. It gets a little bit dicier to use it, but you can do it. It's just a lot more work. What about using a DSLR? The problem with that is you're going to end up with 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 uh, gigabyte video files mm -hmm. that uh, Registax will have difficulty using. I've tried that. That works. The only problem is um, I had to do some video editing to get the file size down to where Registax would tolerate it. And then you have this huge frame with a small image in the middle, and you could have been just as well off with a 5x4 millimeter camera. Horses for courses. Sorry? Horses for courses. Yeah. Uh, you need a good equatorial mount, uh, equatorial driven uh, telescope. You're not going to do it very well with, a, with a, an ASL mount with no drive. If you have a, a drive in azimuth elevation, that'll work too. Periodic error will be a nuisance, but it won't be a killer. And here's what drives the 30% aperture obstruction business. This is a clear aperture, like a refractor. This is the point spread function of a star image through an aperture. There'll be a little ring of light around that, which is the diffraction ring caused by the aperture itself. Physical size of this thing is a function of the aperture and also of the F ratio of the optics. If you have a 25% obstruction, the energy is taken from the main uh, spike and is distributed around a larger ring. That causes loss of contrast in your image. You can compensate for this with processing later on, but if you have a 50%, I'm not sure you can do it. It's certainly not 75%. Look at the lots of energy is distributed all over the place. So your contrast is blown out. So I'd stay in the range of 30 to 50%. Oh, yeah, 50% is probably the maximum. Again, most Schmidt Cassegrains are in the range of 30% aperture obstruction. If you have a long focal length refractor, that's the best. But they're expensive and difficult to mount. The 8 inch up here works great for planetary imaging. So does that 120 millimeter aperture refractor I bolted to the side of it. That takes some real nice images too. That's why I said 120 millimeters will work. Uh, how about we take a quick break? I'm wearing down. This image has a, a few examples of relatively low cost cameras for planetary imaging. I'm not selling these cameras. I don't care what you buy. Uh, I go cheap. This is the one I bought. Okay. It's very good. The camera that's up on the uh, eight inch scope on the 120 millimeter refractor is that camera. Okay. And it does great imaging for planetary stuff. Focal length that's minimum is about 3,000 millimeters. However, you get to it with 
whatever uh, barlows you put in, that's what you're going to need. 2,500 millimeters you might get away with. 3,000 is better. <coughs> 4,000 better still. <coughs> Much more than that. And you're going to run out of light. And that will be a problem too. So you're going to have to play with your scope and whatever focal length you end up with with Barlow's to figure out how long a focal length you can have without running out of light. If your exposures get longer than about 30 milliseconds, you've got too little light. You might get by with 100 millisecond exposures. Nothing longer than that. Okay? Because if you have it longer than that, you'll start to bridge the good zones with the bad zones inside that integration time. That's why it's difficult to take good pictures of planets with film. You don't have the ability to take short exposures and average them out. So the digital world has revolutionized planetary imaging for amateurs. Accurate focus, needless to say, is critical. I don't even know why I put that on there. Uh, set the exposure to avoid saturation. Registax does a good job, but it can't fix overexposures. And you cannot extract something that's burned out. Okay? AVI images must be uncompressed. That means you're going to have huge files. Uh, 200, with that camera, that QHY camera, 200 exposures is almost a gigabyte of images, okay? This machine will handle 200 images, fine. Maybe 500 images. Beyond that, it starts to, to die. If you have a really fast machine with huge amount of uh, random access memory, then you can take many times larger numbers of images in your uh, AVI series and you can play the games. So I've had pretty good luck with the 200 to 400 frames in range. If your seeing is so bad that you need more than that, you got a problem. But more images on good seeing means you're going to get a, a, a lower noise image. Remember, the noise goes as the square root of the number of images, the square root of the number of photons ri arriving in, in effect. So the for a given exposure, the more images you average, the lower the noise gets. But it doesn't get lower f very fast. Okay? Uh, process them with Registax 6. We will do that. Do I don't know if we'll have. I'm sorry? What do you use for acquisition? What software do you use for acquisition of the uh, Good question. Um, there are free software packages. There is a. Uh, program called Sharp Cap. I think it's version 2.8 now. Sharp Cap. I don't know if I put it on the disc. You can get it from a guy at the UK in the UK who's actually building it. it. Has a long list of cameras that it'll read. Okay. That will get your frame up on the screen of your computer. You can do all the focusing. They even have focusing help tools in there. You click a button, acquire a bunch of images. You can set the number of images and it will automatically stop at the end of that number. It puts them in AVI uncompressed. And then Registax will take that AVI file and examine each and every frame in it. Okay. That will work with this camera? It will work with that camera. It will work with any camera that's on the list of cameras that it has in its uh, and it's a website. Okay? Fire capture is another one. Fire capture is another one that will work just as well. Okay. And I think that's free also, right? Okay. <clears throat> um, I already said this. Uh, Registax searches for the sharpest images and, and uh, saves them. You can adjust the threshold of where that is by you know, what percentage of images you want to keep. I usually set it to keep 80% of the images. Uh, seeing is bad, you want to have it take fewer images because you know they're... In other words, if it's, if it's going to be a set percentage, 
it's going to be degraded as the scene gets worse. So you're going to have to be the judge of how many, what percentage of the images you're going to save based upon the seeing. If the seeing is crap, don't even bother taking images because Registax will not do you any good if the seeing is bad. There's nothing you can do about it. Do you have any experience with auto stacker? I have not, but other people have had experience with it and it's supposed to be pretty good. Right, that's what I use. Okay. It seems to do better with big files also. Than yeah, I've heard that too. That's better. Although, to some extent, it'll be affected by your particular machine. This machine is uh, its not a barn burner. It's, it's sort of basic. It'll do fine for auto-guiding. It'll do fine for the planetary imaging with that camera. If I put a camera with a larger number of pixels, it starts to stumble. You know, I use this machine because it takes very little power to run it. I can run it in the field off of a battery pack all night long. And that's why I have this. I have a, you know, a core i7, uh, eight core machine that'll burn down the battery in two hours. And that's no good if I'm going to do imaging. Which one is that? It's just a plain old Dell PC. It's a notebook PC. There's lots of machines that, that would work just as well. This is the one I've got. It's a Latitude uh, 11. Uh, it's the cheapest one. This is what? $400, $300, somewhere in that range. And, you know, it does the job I need, and that's all that matters. However, when we get to this uh, second part, which I'm coming up to now, and we start doing the processing and stacking, this little machine will do it in a certain amount of time. Okay. With the data that I gave you, I gave you some data on uh, Orion's sword, and that's what we're going to work with tonight. Uh, this machine will take close to an hour to stack those images. My desktop takes 10 minutes. Okay. So how long it takes is a function of how many cores, processor cores, and how fast they are, and how much RAM you've got. So. Depending on what machine you've got tonight, you may or may not be able to stack your images anyway. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip through this stuff because I want to get to the actual processing. But um, GIMP is only usable up to a point. GIMP is only good for images that are digitized 8 bits per color. And that's not enough to do deep sky stretches that you have for really faint objects. It will not work well. Uh, and I'll show you exactly what happens when you do process with GIMP. And as I look on their site, they have a beta version. Of yes. But that's been three months since that was announced. Yeah, I know. I'm waiting. Yeah. When? Well, actually, I went, I went, it said you could download the beta version. Yeah, there's a, there's a gotcha there. It'll work in Linux. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. I'm going to uh, shut this guy down for a minute. I'm going to switch memory cards so we can look at the data. Okay. What we're going to do is go through some examples of what you have to do with uh, Deep Sky Stacker to uh, process the data that I gave you. Now, the data I gave you is kind of funny. It was not taken in a dark sky area. It was taken in my backyard with Bortle 8 to 9 light pollution levels. Short exposures, two minutes per uh, sub-exposure. There is enough image quality there to be able to go through this process and experience some of the problems having to do with uh, uh, light gradients that often show up in deep sky images when you're not in a perfectly dark sky area. And even if you are, sometimes um, sky glow will cause gradients too. So 
Um, we're going to get kind of two things out of that same set of data. I'm going to show you how to process with Deep Sky Stacker. I'm also going to show you how to extract out light gradients from your images. Um, GIMP will do some semblance of what that is with the 8-bit capability, but then the image quality degrades rather, cra rather rapidly from there. So, um, for your images, when you're using a tracker on a tripod or even a, a fixed tripod, you'll end up with uh, uh, a uh, histogram that looks like what you see here on the left. where most of the data is confined to the lower left edge of it. And what you want to do is some of this is going to be light pollution, even in a dark sky area with a wide field of view. And some of it's stuff that you want to keep. And sometimes putting a simple S curve on there is enough to clean up the image. And here's an example. I don't know if you can see that well from where you're sitting, but that's the original image. And this one's just a bit snappier, okay? And that's pretty much all you can do with images that are taken using a fixed tripod. Nice Milky Way images with foreground objects in the scene. And if you're real lucky, like I was here, you'll get a meteor in there. Now, the luck wasn't quite so serendipitous. I did this during the Perseids night, so I was pretty assured of getting something. Okay. Um, Camera on a tracking head is going to do the, essentially the same thing that we're going to do with an auto-guided camera. We're going to stack images in the, in the same sort of uh, situation. You're going to take your dark frames, your flat frames, the bias frames are not critical for DSLRs. But if you have a camera that is an uh, astrophotography dedicated camera, the bias images are critical. You must do that. In fact, there's a list of other uh, calibration factors that I don't even include here that you need to include in those cases to calibrate the camera. Okay. So we're going to open a bunch of picture files. We're going to examine the picture files for bad images. I took out all the bad images, so you won't have to do that. But I'll show you how that uh, gets done. You're going to run the stacking with all the calibration and then you're going to uh, set some configuration in the process of getting all these images in place you're going to do some configuration setups to make sure that you get the kind of processing you want. The open screen is what you see here. You can actually start it up on your PC if you have one. Start up the uh, Deep Sky Stacker and you'll see what's here. There's a, a list of calibration files and image files. The top line here is the image data files. You load those up and you'll examine the images first to look for bad images and then you'll load up all your calibration images, whatever ones you're going to include. Certainly flat field and certainly dark frames. Okay? Now, for those images I took in the light polluted sky, the dark frame image is, use, is virtually useless. And paradoxically, and I haven't quite figured out why this is so, the flat field image wasn't worth a damn either. Because after I applied the flat field image and got rid of the vignetting that I know was there, I still had a gradient in the light pollution. And I have not figured out why that's so. Anybody figures that out? Let me know, because I haven't figured it out yet. Um, first thing to do is you open the primary images, and you're going to end up with a list here. And you're going to put a check mark beside each image that you're going to use in your stacking. Or you can do the converse. You can do uh, the, click the button that says check all. It'll check all of them. You go and examine all the images and look for the bad ones and uncheck it. That's usually the easiest thing to do. 
Okay. How do we get them there? I'm sorry? I don't have anything there. Are we supposed to have anything on our screen there? Well, if you did you load in, you didn't load in, you've got the images in your imaging, right? Yeah. Okay. We should click on, click on, oh, go back here. Click on open picture files and then navigate to where you've got those images saved that I had on that DVD. Where? Yeah. Yeah. If there's, it says open picture files. That's that red highlighted item in the list. There's the open picture files, there's dark files, flat files, dark flat files, and offset files. All those are in there. You may, you know, we only have dark files and flat files, the rest of them we don't have. And it's sort of irrelevant for this particular situation. So you get those images open, or in that list. Did you find them? Um, I have a folder on my desktop image files. Yes. From that DVD, correct? Yes. OK. There's the image files that are 120 second exposures that should be in the list. You find them? There are CR2 files. They're raw files. There's about 40 of them. Uh, it should show up with uh, DSS. No, that's no, that's that's not the one. That's the I have a Ryan Sword. Yeah. Ryan Sword dark files or Ryan Sword flat files? The Ryan Sword picture. Picture files. Picture files. Got it. Okay. okay. There should be a long list there. Open all of them. Open all of them. Which one? The dark file, flat file, picture files. Just start with the picture files. That's the what we want to start with to begin with. We're gonna to have to switch some files here. I'm just going to skip the slides for now because we're going to do it. Select them all. We're another. We're going to. We're going to. All of this processing that we're talking going to be talking about tonight, if we get to it, is procedures for taking the images you've taken, the sub-exposures, stacking them, and producing a good image that, after post-processing. It, no, here. We're going to do the Lockwood session on the 9th. Um, between now and the 9th, there's 4th of July, basically. There's a, a board meeting here next week. So we can't do it next week. The Saturday of that next week is the Dark Sky session. So it doesn't make a great deal of difference whether we do processing tonight or after the dark sky session. Oh, well, in that case, here we go. The date for this is July 13th. And on July 13th is when it's scheduled. Actually, we have a couple of things scheduled that night, and this will be part of it. So you see, there's IMG061. Yes. That's the first file. Yes. So you go all the way down to the uh, 690. You hold down the uh, shift key and click, and it'll highlight all of them. At least on a PC it does. I don't know how you do it on a Mac. Same thing. I think the solution is to get a PC. OK. Um, you click open. All of them? All of them. You'll get a list of files on the screen. You see that? Your list of files on the screen. If you pick one of those files and double click it, of course the slow machine is not helping us. There we go. There's the image. Okay? It has that reddish color to it. That's the light pollution. I have a light pollution filter on the uh, telescope to reduce that a bit, and it tends to shift the color even more. Now, the important thing here is, you see the cursor? If 
I take the point of that and put it close to a star, you see the star on the upper right hand in the left corner? That gives you a roughly 30 pixel view. Maybe, no, it's more than that. It's about a 100 pixel view of the star. Wow. Cool. And that gives, you an ex that gives you a chance to go around and check to see if there's any, for example, out here, you see the, the slight elongation there? Ah, can't hold it. Wow. Slight elongation there in the extreme corner. That's the field flattener not quite doing a perfect job. Okay? But you get something toward the center, and it's looking pretty good. It's pretty good, yeah. Okay? Nice double star there. Better than what I normally have. Okay? <laughs> and that's what, when you have auto guiding like I showed you inside that two arc second circle, that's what you're going to get in the stars in your, your uh, sub exposure. Okay? So, what you're going to do initially when you bring home your stuff from your dark sky session. You're going to double click on each one of these star uh, images and well, what I would do first is to, is to do a check all which is in this list here, right here. Check all. And then go through and examine all the images and any ones that have image flaws in them that you don't want you take the check off. Typically you're going to have this set I think I had five images that were bad because of different things that went wrong, including kicking the, set, the tripod. <laughs> I got up to go to get a drink, I get a cup of coffee, came back, sat down, clunk, oh, there goes that image. <laughs> so it's not just me. <laughs> no. Listen, I guarantee you're going to screw up an image or two. All right. So, all the images are okay. So, I would go and get the dark files. And you'll just click to the. Where are they? There it is. Double click. And then you just select all those the same way. There's only 10 of them. Okay. Select all of those. And then go to the flat field files, and you select all of those. You'll have to navigate to them for the first time, and you open those. So now you've got the image files, the flat files, and the dark frame files all loaded into the DSS. Okay? Now there's a, an item here that says register checked pictures. That's what gets the process started, but it doesn't immediately. If you click that, it brings up a window. You're going to click on recommended settings. And you're going to check to see if there's any flags in there. There usually is when there's not certain files available. Uh, this particular one says uh, stacking 30 light frames, just to remind you what it is. Okay, so that's it's a it recommended settings. You see it? Okay, fine. Now the second box. Now that first box, that first window, the recommended settings, it just gives you information on what you've got in your data set and whether there's any problems with it. What's the initial command? The recommended settings. That's this one right here with the cursor setting. But how did you get to that? Oh, the initial is uh, register right check oh. images. Oh, okay. See, register settings comes up. It doesn't just jump into re registering the settings. It gives you a chance to set parameters before you do. It says you must check light frames to register them. Did you, check, did you click this thing to check all? Uh, you see where I'm pointed? Uh, check. There's a button that says check all. Oh. Click that. Okay. That'll get all your light images okay. checked. Okay. Got them? Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. The button below the bottom left corner is called stacking parameters. This one, you're not going to mess with much of anything. 
Okay. Uh, you're going to use standard mode. You're going to use averaging. You're going to use median for the uh, uh, dark frames. In other words, it takes the uh, the pixels that are the median of all ten that you've taken of dark images, or however many you've taken. Uh, flat field is the same thing. Alignment is going to be automatic. Uh, intermediate frames, you want to check this thing that says TIFF files. I do that because TIFF files are more standard. Uh, Photoshop will read them. Uh, and so will GIMP. The FITS files, however, are the standard for the astronomy community. They have a lot of information in them. They are better to use in general if you have tools to handle them. But there's not much difference in terms of image quality for the TIFF file, so that's okay. Now, Deep Sky Stacker is going to take in your images. Hopefully you've saved them raw. That's what Sierra 2 is in this particular case. The camera digitizes to 14 bits. They are saved as 16 bit per color images. In, in, D, in DSS uh, processing. However, all of the processing in DSS is in 32 bits per color. And the image that's going to pop out at the end is going to be a 32 bit per color image. Even Photoshop has trouble with that. It'll do it, but it, it disables most of the, the neat features in it. Okay? But Deep Sky Stacker will handle the full 32-bit per color images. And there's one place where, they're, where it's very valuable when you're doing the stretching. That's when the 32 bits per color is going to save your bacon. Because you're going to be taking a small section of the histogram of your image, and you're going to stretch it out a factor of 5 to 10. If you have only 8 bits per color, you're going to kill the image altogether. And I'll show you what images look like when they're stretched beyond their limits. Okay? So, Deep Sky Stacker and a lot of other of these programs that you pay for run in 32 bits per color internally to preserve as much dynamic range as possible in your stacked images. Okay, so TIFF files are what you want for the intermediate files. There's a cosmetic tab. You don't have to do this right now. It's in the handout. There are some slider settings here. I recommend you click, put check marks in both of these and use the same slider settings. These will give you, uh, will clean your image of hot pixels that are not removed by the dark frame. And it will also clean out the cold pixels, those that aren't responding very well at all. And both of those will affect the quality of your image for the better if you if you set up those parameters. What threshold do you have? Sorry? What threshold do you have? I guess. Well, I, you can't see it on the screen, but I have one pixel for the uh, filter size. For the threshold, I set it at 70.6 percent. It's all in the handout. You don't need to do this now. This is not critical to this particular session, but when you do it in the future, you'll want to do this. The most important setting is the output. Okay? You can't keep it from doing that. And you're going to create an output file, a, 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 a folder, where you're going to put those images. You'll create a folder somewhere in your machine. You'll navigate to it by clicking on this. You'll navigate to it and set it up as the point where the output images will go. Okay? Doesn't matter where it is, just as long as it's there. You should check that setting every time you have a photo session for every object. Because it's best to keep all your objects in separate folders. And what I usually do is I create a folder that has the images, say, for M8 or M20 or M42 or whatever it is. It'll have the light images, it'll have the dark images, it'll have the flat images, it'll have the output images all in that folder. Okay? Do whatever you want, but that's what I've done here. 
you click OK after the, all those settings are gone. Okay, after you've done all that, you click OK. There's one more chance to check things in this uh, pop-up window. It shows whether there's any potential problems. They'll be highlighted in red and said there's no offset images. I don't care. If something else shows up in there that might be a problem, you might want to abort this thing <coughs> and attend to it. Okay? Sir, have you ever had this happen where you're in the middle of it and... It's, it's, just, it's a new computer and, you know, I, I just... Uh, my comment was Bill Gates. It decided it wants to automatically update me. <laughs> Uh, okay, send a poison letter to Bill Gates. Not much you can do about that. Nothing you can do about it. Um, you do want to do something about disabling that automatic yes. update. Okay, if I click OK here, it'll start stacking this stuff. It's going to take close to an hour on this slow machine, so I'm going to cancel out. Okay, I'm going to show you something that I... Um, think I've got in here. Here's the output images. Um, Deep Sky Stacker will save all your output images with the file name autosave. That is going to be a TIFF file with 32 bits per color digitizing. It's a monster. It's 162 megabytes. Okay. Now if we start up Deep Size Stacker again, and I go to, here it says, um, open picture file. And I go to, I navigate to the output image file, auto save, and open it. And this takes a while, because it's a huge image on a slow computer, so be patient for a moment. What I'm going to show you here is what to do with the stretching. You're going to do two sessions of, of dynamic range stretching in your images. You're going to do one here, which does most of the stretching. And you're going to do a bunch of minor stretching operations in your image processing software, whether it's GIMP or Photoshop. Don't ask me why it loads these things in blocks, but it does. <coughs> Okay, you'll see one thing right away. What happened to the rust-colored image? It's gray. Uh -huh. Deep Sky Stacker does some attempts at graying the background. That has both good features and bad features. It does a global color correction to get gray in the background. Unfortunately, a light polluted image is not gray. So what's going to happen is you're going to end up with a color error, which we'll fix in just a minute after this loads. Down here, you'll see the controls for doing the processing. We're going to work on the, the RGB to do a color correction. And we're going to do an illuminance stretch. That's under this tab. You'll notice that there are, are some cryptic things here, log square root. That is the stretching function. If you, if you click on this, it'll show you what stretching functions are available. Okay? Log square root is pretty good for images like this that are in a light polluted sky. Um, the arc sign, hyperbolic sign, is pretty good for images that are very dark like you've taken in a dark sky uh, setting. By that I mean dark sky as in you're in Death Valley taking images where it's really dark. Uh, I think the Lockwood Valley site might work well with this log square root. And we'll find out when we do it, when we actually do those images. What we're gonna do is we're gonna click reset and it's going to show you the, the stretching function that, that's available to you. Okay? 
Notice there are three histograms there, red, green, and blue. The green, the green and red histograms are roughly lying over one another. The blue is shifted. It was shifted because of the light pollution. So we're going to grab a hold of this slider on the blue. I'm going to move that over roughly on top of the rest of it. It's not an accurate thing, just roughly. Okay? Now, this box here says link settings. You click, put a check mark in there. Any other changes you make in this is going to do it on all of them. So don't make any changes now. Okay? You're going to click on the luminance, and it brings up the sliders controlling the stretching function itself. There is a section that is darkness, which is primarily the background, it's a dark sky. There is a mid-range, which hopefully will hold a good part of your image data, which you can see here in the histogram. It's a big spike there in the middle. And there's the highlight, which you don't want to be too strongly stretched because it'll make your star images bloat get bigger. We want to avoid that as much as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the various sliders here. We're going to hit the, this adjusts, this slider here adjusts the steepness of this curve. And this is trial and error. There's no science to this right now. And unfortunately this doesn't give you any feedback on the screen. So it literally is trial and error. So what I do is I typically steepen up the curve and I move it along so it's roughly in the middle of the histogram for the image. Okay? Everything below for all practical purposes is light pollution. So I'm going to set that just a little bit steeper down there. Now the upper end here is the star images mostly. So what I want to do is make sure that is a reasonably mild slope. It's trial and error. You pick something, you try it. Okay? So when you have something that you think is going to work, and you'll get experience doing this over time, you'll know what to do. I know for light polluted images, these settings are about right. Then you click apply. And it goes through and it does that stretching. And you'll slowly see as it, as it goes through that process, it brings up a lot more nebulosity in M42 than was there before. Okay? And as that develops, you're going to notice something else that's happened. You know, over on the right side, you'll see it's dark. In the middle, it's pretty bright. And then to the left side, it's not as dark. That's what's left after you've done the flat field. So you've gotten rid of the vignetting for your lens. That's caused by light pollution. Now, it has to do with the particular geometry of my backyard relative to the lights. I, Sierra Madre is located up close to the mountains. So anything north is dark. There's no lights up there. I'm imaging to the south. That's over the worst light polluted area in the county. Okay. For some reason, um, there is a great deal of variability in the light pollution in terms of how it distributes across the frame. And this is only about a three degree wide field of view. Okay. I can't explain why that's there, but we can get rid of it. So at this point, we will take this image, if you're satisfied with it, for all practical purposes, you are, purposes we are, we will go down to the, um, where is it, uh, save picture file, it brings up a, a uh, an opportunity to change the file name. You're going to save it as a 16-bit per channel image. That makes it easier for Photoshop if you've got it or anything else. Not many things will handle the 32-bit images. I do give it a name that's appropriate. I've already done that. Okay.
Okay, so I'm going to stop this and we'll go back and look at those images. Okay. Here's Orion's sword with a 16 bit. We can load. Here we go. That's what we had after we stretched the image. Okay? Now, um, I made some adjustments in GIMP and in Photoshop with the 16 bit images to do some additional stretching. And I'll go through that in detail next time because we're at 10 o'clock and we have to bail out. But let's look at this for a moment. If I do the final bit of stretching and uh, removal of the gradient in Photoshop, I get this. Okay? It's not great, but it's not bad considering it was in a light polluted sky. Okay? Here's what I got doing the same exact thing in GIMP. You notice this? That's, that's because I've stretched the image in GIMP well beyond what I can do with an 8-bit per color image. And you end up with a gradient caused by the limited digitizing range that's in there. And that's the reason 8-bits per color isn't going to cut it. Those two images were processed in exactly the same set of steps, except one was in GIMP and one was in Photoshop. So why do we use GIMP? It's free. Photoshop is 600 bucks, but you can't get it for that anymore. You have to pay 20 bucks a month to rent it. 10 bucks a month. 10 bucks a month. I'm correct. I'm, I stand corrected. Okay. If you don't mind storing all your images on their uh, cloud, it'll let you store them locally? Okay. 10 bucks a month will get you Photoshop. Well, it gets you live and Photoshop. Yes. Better still. Okay, so I can take and crop that, that image I did in Photoshop to get rid of the edges. You notice the edges of that image were pretty bad. Part of it was because of the stacking process, and part of it was because of the, the gradient removal. If I just crop it out and get what I can out of it, that's what I got. Again, that was done in a severely light polluted sky. So this is the result of all the stack shots? All the stack shots and all the processing in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to have to stop. It's 10 o'clock. Now, where was that tutorial you were mentioning? Was that on the disk you gave us? Yeah. Okay, learn how to use it. Yeah. Um, we're going to, yeah, we're going to finish this next session. I'm going to try to get something scheduled for the 13th. I think it's already scheduled. Um, Another classroom session? It's another classroom session. Its primary function is to talk about how to deal with these light polluted images. 13th of July? 13th of July. Okay. July 9th is the dark sky session. Those of you who signed up for it, you will meet you will meet us out at the Lockwood Valley site. It's a Saturday. Be, it's a Saturday. Before sunset. Please do not come after dark. If you can't make it before sunset, don't bother. Oh, yeah. See you there. <laughs> okay.